Welcome to Rumination, the podcast that offers factual information and practical solutions to the challenges in our dairy industry today. This is Chris Gwynn, and today I'm honored to have Dr. Adam Locke of Michigan State University. Dr. Locke is a well-recognized expert in fatty acids, digestion, metabolism in the dairy cow in particular, and the impact on bioactive fatty acids, both on animal production and on human health. In 2019, Dr. Locke received the American Feed Industry Association Award from the American Dairy Science Association for his research that he has done in advancing dairy cattle nutrition. Thank you, Dr. Locke, for joining Rumination today. Oh, thank you, Chris, uh, for the kind introduction and for having me on your podcast today. I'm uh, looking forward to discussing. Well, that's what it's all about. And so I wanted to present to you, Dr. Locke, uh, looking at your research focus for the past 15 years, it's been on fatty acid nutrition of, of ruminants, dairy cows more specifically, including the impact on milk production and milk fat content. And the question comes to mind, what, what first got you into that area of research? Well, that's a, that's a great question. I should try and keep that one short. I can often talk along, long about that. But uh, I mean, the simple thing is I was born and raised on a dairy farm. Um, you can probably tell from the accent, not from here in Michigan, but uh, from a, a small dairy farm in uh, North Devon in England. Then ended up doing a PhD in dairy nutrition that happened to be in this world of what was called conjugated linoleic acids. And at the time, I really had no idea what they were. And then we started to learn more about them. And, you know, my, my interests have pivoted from milk fat depression to bioactive fatty acids. Well, it certainly has. And I think that's why, again, the... The uh, ADSA and the AFIA award in 2019 on the, the amount of publications you've done, which is literally over 100 of them looking at fats and how that's improving the efficiency of, of dairy cows and farms. But fats, I wanted to stick back to that and, and take me on a short tour, if you will, on fatty acid digestion and metabolism in dairy cow from when we literally feed a cow her TMR, her ration that includes fats and in all parts of that and how that moves through the cow's system from digestion to absorption and then through the creation of milk fat, if, if yes, you would. Sure. I think uh, I, I like analogies. I, I use them quite a lot. And I think a simpler analogy here is to first of all, think about nearly every uh, dietary ingredient or piece of feed a, a ruminant or a dairy cow eats has a, a some degree of fatty acids in it or fat in it and variable extents, just like foods that we eat as humans, you can have lower fat and you have higher fat components of your diet. Uh, but if you think most of the fat that cows consume is in some sort of form of vegetable oil, okay? So if you think uh, of a bottle of corn oil or canola oil or rapeseed oil, if you think of that going into the cow and what comes out the mammary gland is butter. So you've got these two very different fats, sort of fats, right? You've got the input and the output. And the, bit, the, the key reason for those differences is the rumen. You know, dairy cows are ruminants, sheep, goats, etc. as well. Uh, dairy cows are ruminants. And so really what you're doing when you're feeding the cow is you are feeding the rumen bacteria. You know, that rumen is a huge fermentation vat, basically, much like, a you know, for making beer or anything like that. It's chock full of all different types of bacteria, protozoa. Um, so the reason we go from that very unsaturated vegetable oil to butter is basically rumen bacteria do this, what we call biohydrogenation. It's just really a fancy term for a somewhat of a detoxifying mechanism, converting unsaturated fatty acids to saturated fatty acids. So the major fatty acids in an unsaturated fatty acid in a dairy cow diet are linoleic, linolenic, and oleic acid. Okay. And they all, the vast majority of them, anywhere from 75 to 95% get converted to stearic acid, a saturated fatty acid. So what comes into the rumen is very unsaturated. What leaves the rumen and is ultimately available for absorption um, is very saturated. And so stearic acid and, and palmitic acid, which we're going to talk more about later on, nearly all feed ingredients contain palmitic acid as well. Uh, palmitic acid often may be the second or most to be the third most prevalent fatty acid you'll find in that dairy cow diet. And this isn't just in a TMR or a house type situation. Most people forget that typically the highest fat diet a dairy cow might receive is a cow on very fresh pasture. So a cow on very fresh pasture may have five, six percent fatty acids in the diet because that that leaf in a pasture is chock full of 
chlorophyll and that's where there's a lot of linolenic acid in there so you know if if i ever hear someone say to me oh you shouldn't feed fat to a dairy cow ruminants aren't designed to eat fat i will remind them that you know even if we're formulating a tmr that might have five percent fatty acids in it that's a high level probably still not as high as if we threw a cow out onto fresh pasture or a cow was natively in very young lush pasture so all of that most of that unsaturated fat gets converted to saturated fatty acids they are absorbed by the dairy cow so the major fatty acids the dairy cow has available to her is palmitic acid and stearic acid so these fatty acids reach the mammary gland now a key thing for the whole discussion today is even though we have butter that comes out the mammary gland so butter and what and milk milk fat i should say that comes out the mammary gland milk fat because of that ruminant process she's a ruminant it's a saturate it's a richer source of saturated fatty acids and maybe we'll do another podcast on milk fat and human health at another time but it is always has been and always will be a relatively higher source of saturated fatty acids so yeah so the fats coming into her udder that she's creating from the rumen or some of them coming directly from the feed i'm assuming she's able to adjust and keep that milk fluid and she's it's very biodynamic of how things are changing and she can decide to make less c18 and, and more c16 or c14 yeah and and a big one is maybe if there if there's more what we're seeing in a lot of our work if there's more c16 available which is allowing her to make more milk fat she would then also produce typically more four carbons and six carbons because you know you're balancing out that higher melting point with some more lower melting points so you know there's much more work to do in that area in terms of the product quality side ultimately the cow is producing a liquid milk fat now from a manufacturing point of view maybe there there are some maybe some differences there but we know of differences in milk fatty acid profile due to a whole host of reasons yeah and and that was one of the uh, the next questions I wanted to touch base on was you've talked about um, these fats well fats and I'll slash oils in the cow's diet that's what nature intended she's able as you said to convert these unsaturated may I say less desirable maybe that's unfair to the triglycerides and the udder to make the the beautiful combination of three hundred plus fatty acids that make up milk and dairy products. So, and, and I think you touched on how those changes impact the milk itself in its fluidity, right? And so then there's been a lot of excitement, and you mentioned it earlier, about the palmitic acid. There's been a lot of excitement in, in Canada as of late. You've pun published a great deal of research in this area. So the question for you is, is, you know, what does palmitic fatty acid feeding do to cows, both on her production efficiency and possibly on the milk itself? Yeah, good, good questions. Yeah. So you make a good point a minute ago, and I should have made that, is that uh, milk fat is probably the most diverse lipid matrix you'll find anywhere in nature. You know, because of this unique ruminant process, you know, over 400 fatty acids have been identified in milk. Maybe 12 to 15 make up over 95% of that, but there are lots of, of, of other ones in there. So it's a fascinating uh, lipid matrix. Yes, we've been uh, focused on individual different fatty acids, different combinations of fatty acids. Uh, palmitic acid feeding has probably come about more in the last decade. Uh, not to be confused with palm oil. There's a huge amount of confusion in the in the press right now and where people, are, I think, have taken the palmitic acid and now palm oil and all palm is kind of all, all all lumped in there together there's a very di big difference between palmitic acid supplement or a palmitic acid enriched supplement and palm oil i think i read a, a thing yesterday that was like comparing palm oil to like you know crude oil and then the palmitic acid enriched would be gasoline or you know a specific fraction of of oil and that's really palm oil palmitic acid like the difference there where palmitic acid has a really unique role in dairy cow nutrition is that very consistently we and others show that when you provide more palmitic acid in the diet the cow will make more milk fat and sometimes that will drive more milk yield and maybe more milk protein yield as well if it comes along with it but primarily it's around milk fat and the reasons we think that is true comes back to that synthesis of fat in the mammary gland that there's good data showing that 
To initiate more triglycerides, the cow utilizes palmitic acid and a glycerol backbone. So if we provide more palmitic acid in the mammary gland, she can start to produce more triglycerides or mono and glycerides that die and then triglycerides. So she's, she's taking the, the C16 and then adding other fats to that, that glycerol. Yeah, so backbone. if you start to make more triglycerides, she has to bring other fatty acids with it. And that's very different than if you may be fed more longer chain fatty acids, such as steric or, or, or some of the unsaturates, where you would often maybe get more of those in milk, but then she would maybe produce less shorter chain fatty acids. So we'd get kind of what we call a substitution no more fat yield, it's just it's just a different profile of it. Whereas with palmitic acid, you consistently drive more milk fat yield, and that brings along so maybe more of that C4 and, and things like that we're talking. Now, there are some differences there in uh, milk fatty acid profile, but they're quite subtle, and we, we've been trying to uh, look at some of that more recently. The other thing with palmitic acid, we actually improve fiber digestion in the rumen, which is not to be forgotten that's a very consistent response that we see so we can actually then get more nutrients or more energy from our forages that we feed which again important to remember um we as humans can't can't utilize the vast majority of the feeds that we provide a cow so if you think of all the forages that the cow feeds she's converting non-human edible food into milk and dairy products which is a very high quality source of protein and fat and essential vitamins and minerals uh, the other part of this is when we talk about the palm products in that we utilize in dairy cows, they are primarily, um, or the vast majority, are waste products or byproducts from other industries uh, from palm, the same as we utilize soybean meal, canola meal, distiller's grains, sugar beet, you know, cotton seed. These are all waste and byproducts from human industries that we can utilize in the dairy industry. Otherwise, many of them would perhaps end up in landfills. So it's a very efficient way of utilizing uh, waste or byproducts from other, uh, other, other places as well. But palmitic acid is important to that and palm oil. While well, they sound the same, but they are quite different. And both of them have a role in the dairy industry as sources of nutrients and energy. Let me take you back because you talked about the fiber digestion improvement with palmitic acids and we shouldn't just gloss over that because the whole idea, so feeding concentrated fat supplements to dairy cows meets her nutritional needs during periods of, of high output, which is really important. Palmitic acid blends and palmitic acid itself preferentially seems to be increasing butterfat yield, which is great to to supply the our consumers is what they're asking for. But what you're also saying is beyond that efficiency of increasing butterfat yield, we're also getting an overall diet digestibility efficiency so that she's making all that without with actually eating less feed, right? Well, so yeah, I see what you're saying, but we don't typically see they eat less feed, but they produce more energy corrected milk or yield of milk and milk components are typically increased. Uh, you know, and in most markets, I realize with differences with quota versus other markets here in North America, that ultimately you're, you're really paid on how much the yield of fat, yield of protein that's being produced. So if we can get more of those from the same amount of feed or from less feed, um, I, I think that's a good thing. And the other thing we've been showing you could, we, that you can do with uh, you can often feed a higher forage fiber with some more of these uh, specific fatty acid supplements in. Uh, allowing you to feed less starch would be less less grain in the diet as well. So so there's a lot of opportunities there. So again, you know, these fats and fatty acids, they're not they're not new that that um, in diets. We've been utilizing uh you know high fat supplements in the dairy industry since, you know, last forty years. You know, different uh, what we're able to do now is target specific fatty acids a lot better and and provide that what the cow can best utilize and best need rather than simply as an energy source much how we now understand difference between like omega-6 omega-3 fatty acids in the human we're starting to get a much better understanding of the differences between specific saturated fatty acids and different um, unsaturated fatty acids in the dairy cow and and formulate diets to very specific needs for what make helps improve production and health of the dairy cow yeah, with that focus, that whole idea of more precise, more precision nutrition. So thank you for that. So take-home messages. What 
the the audience today listening, the the dairy producers, nutritionists, veterinarians, consumers, perhaps for that matter, what would be your take home message about fatty acid feeding and ruminant diets today for them? Yeah, so uh, you know, fatty acids in the dairy cow diets is you know all all feeds contain fatty acids you know to to the, to, to varying extents. Uh, feeding fat supplements is not new. I think what's newer is our, our understanding of the much how we've moved from crude protein to amino acid balancing for diets. We've moved from E for extract or crude fat to fatty acids. You know, palm and par, palm based and palmitic acid enriched supplements have been utilized for a number of years now. Um, we know palmitic acid can um, promote and increase milk fat yield. Um, and then when it comes to the other side of that, you know, milk fat is always primarily a saturated fat source because of that unique rumen you know and then so for me a big take home here is that what's coming out of the mammary gland in terms of milk fat the cow always has to produce a liquid milk fat at body temperature in the kitchen you know that stick of butter yeah and i've reminded this by a, a colleague of mine at cornell dr barbana food scientist a couple of days ago you know but butter doesn't have a single melting point. It has a melting point range because of all those different fatty acids. So at any different given room temperature, you know, a certain proportion of it may be liquid, some of it may be solid, right? And and that, that can change somewhat. Now, there is some data out there looking at different feeding practices or different um, types of diet that's going to shift that. Is it just palmitic acid? I don't think so. I, we do, you know, as a researcher, we need more data on it. At the moment, this, I guess we call it a buttergate issue in Canada right now. Honestly, I've not seen any data to support this room temperature shift in, in butter. And, I, you know, specifically related to this now. Now we can find some papers and, and discuss those. I'd, I'd love to do that at some point. But, you know, I always come back. I was talking to my wife a few days ago, you know, we know that our butter that we keep in the same place in our kitchen in February isn't as soft on the kitchen countertop as it is in July. But we don't keep our house the same temperature either. So um, there, there, there are some of those things in mind. But I think we need to do a lot more research around dairy cow management and product quality. Uh, undoubtedly, we need to understand that better. Um, but that's not – I don't think it's correct – um, and inappropriate to jump in on and say a single feed ingredient is the root cause of this. And we know there's so much variation and so many things uh, that come into play here. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for your insight and your expertise, your knowledge. Dr. Locke, it's been a real pleasure. And I want to thank you for taking the time for sharing your expertise with me and with our audience today. So thank you. Thanks, again. Chris. It's a pleasure. And I want to surely thank our audience for listening to us today so that you won't miss our next episodes of Rumination. Check us out at jeffo.com or find us on Apple and Google Podcasts and Spotify. This podcast was brought to you by Jeffo, Precision Nutrition for a Sustainable World. And have a great day.